Oh, everybody, the door is closing. Welcome all to this great day when Viviane Forsberg is about to defend her doctor doctoral thesis. It's the title, Liquid Phase Exfoliation of Two-Dimensional Materials. And uh, first of all, uh, please check your mobile phones, switch them off if you have the noise on. Uh, my name is Don Bülund. I'm a professor of Middle Eastern University in analytical chemistry, and I will share this event. Uh, and I would like to introduce a number of key persons before we go into the actual defense of the of the thesis. And of course, in the center, we have Vivian Forsberg as the respondent, and uh, we have a number of persons that will scrutinize her thesis. And of course. Uh, we have the faculty opponent, and I'm happy to introduce Luis Ferreira from New uh, University of Lisboa, and uh, from Portugal then, an expert in nanoelectronics, I have heard. So we are happy to have you here. And then we have the evaluating committee, and it's actually those who are about to set the, if we have passed or failed during this, event. And uh, from left to right then we have uh, 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 Professor Fabiola Villaseca Moreira uh, from University of Girona in Spain. And she's also a visiting researcher here at Chalmers currently, I've heard. And then we have uh, Associate Professor Benny Tarnberg, Electronic Department here at Mid Sweden University. And finally, uh, Li Yang. Uh, who is associate professor and a uh, senior uh, project manager at RISE in Venezia. And uh, of course, there's a number of people that have stood behind you during this uh, time as a PhD student. And I would like to introduce also the supervisors, main supervisor, Professor Magnus Norgren, and uh, deputy supervisor, Professor Håkan Olin. But today, you're about to sit silent. <laughs> it's Vivian that will defend her thesis. Uh, I will also briefly go through the procedure. And uh, first of all, Vivian will give a presentation, an overview over her thesis, about 25 minutes or so. After that, we will take a short break, some 10 minutes or so, we'll see. There's a lot of cupcakes out there, so maybe it's 15 minutes, we'll see. Uh, I have to thank my husband for sponsoring me. <laughs> <laughs> well done, husband. <laughs> uh, and after the break, we will have the discussion about the thesis. Uh, the opponent will come in and be the so-called bad guy, really scrutinizing the thesis. And uh, after he has uh, had a discussion with Viviane on the thesis. It's time for the evaluating committee to ask their questions. And finally, it's open for all of you to ask questions on the thesis to Viviane. And once all the questions have been stated, uh, that close this session, and you're all welcome then to uh, a light lunch upstairs from here. But the committee will have a meeting then during this, uh, dri directly after the defense, and then come and give the verdict. And essentially, that's the procedure. And I would like to give the word then to Vivian. And first, I would like to ask you if there's something to add to the thesis, if there's an errata list or something. Quite many typos on the thesis, but not something so so important that I need to highlight right now. First of all, I would like to thank the presence of everybody here, my fellow Hutayan, thanks for coming. Thanks to my supervisors and the committee for accepting this this challenge, or I don't know if you can call it like this. Um, thank you to my uh, Foreman and co-supervisors that are also present, Christina Dahlström and Magnus Hummelgård, and the others that are not present, Joaquin Backstrom and Erin Vingvin. 
So this thesis has been, has uh, the title liquid phase exfoliation of layered of two dimensional materials. It has been, the experiment has been um, done here at Miss Sweden University. Part of this thesis has been written at KTH during this year. So my name is Vivian Foschberg. Can you hear me? I think I didn't take, oh, you took the microphone. <laughs> uh, my name is Vivian Foschberg. Uh, um, I am associated to the Department of Natural Science here at Miss Sweden University. And I hope that you enjoy this presentation. They told me to have fun now, so I hope I can do it. Let's see. So to start with, I want to give a brief overview of what, what is liquid phase exfoliation for, uh, like, uh, so anyone could understand. Basically, what you do is that you add uh, the layered material, in this case, more than the sulfide, into a beaker of water or solvent. You add intense sonicate energy, and then this bulk powder that were initially transparent in water will turn into black. And the reason that it turns into black is that the particles will be individualized and they will start to absorb light, and then they are black in solution. If, if everything was easy as it, we wish it to be, that would be all it. We didn't need to do more work, but it's not like this, right? <laughs> Thermodynamics says that this system wouldn't work because the, the, these layered materials don't have a matching uh, surface energy with, uh, with the water. So it, what happens is that once you stop uh, providing this sonicate energy or the shear exfoliation energy, these uh, particles will ag aggregate and sediment, so they will stack together back together if it's in water. So in this thesis, we will discuss some solutions to this problem when you are exfoliating in water. So you can add stabilizers like soap, even the soap that you have at the, in your house that you, that you to clean the dishes can be used to exfoliate this material. So that's what's fantastic about it. Like it can be very cheap, so that's why it's interesting. And besides soap, you can add cellulose, polymers, and, um, or one of the highlights of this thesis is that we did the exfoliation in water without using any stabilizer, and we achieved good results with that. So, which materials did we use and why? Uh, we used molybdenum grades. One grade was provided by a molybdenum mining in Norway, Knaben molybdenum, and this is a, also some differential of this, this work because this molybdenum was quite uh, different than the other source that we had. Okay, then we use the surfactant SDS, uh, sodium dondecyl sulfate, and hydroxyacetyl cellulose to stabilize the nanosheets in water. These are some pictures. Do you have this? Uh, uh, ah, here. These are some pictures of the materials. I have tried to use some nanocellulose, but it was that not as effective as the hydroxyacetyl cellulose for the purpose I want. And the, the grades the, of molybdenum that I use have different particle size. So one was very, very fine. The other was around like one micrometer to start with. And this is the molecular of ethyl cellulose. So it's a, a cellulose that has been modified to be more hydrophilic. So that's why it's interesting for me. All right. then. Why is interesting then these black liquids? What can we do with that? <laughs> yeah. um, the liquid phase, uh, first of all, we are thinking about commercialization. This field has started some, something like 12 years ago, and uh, it has had a tremendous success. It's one of the biggest uh, um, money hunters, let's say, for in the European Union, so the biggest projects run on this liquid phase exfoliation topic. And why is that? Because there is a huge potential for it in the market, and that also drives science. So the liquid phase exfoliation discussion here, it can be used not only for exfoliating more than the sulfide, but other layered materials like graphene. But my field was the semiconductor more than the sulfide, so we will focus on that. 
Nowadays, these materials have already been commercialized by the tone. There are a number of common companies producing it, but it's still a question that uh, how sustainable this production is because most of the production has been done in, in organic solvents that are not friendly to the environment. So it's uh, sustainable production in water with stabilizers is great, but if you have no stabilizer, then you, you even have an advantage there. It's an ideal case. Okay. We are talking about very, very small materials uh, when we exfoliate them in water. Then we wish to give you a perspective on how small we are talking about. So we are located somewhere in between nanoparticles and colloids. So in this, in this range, from one nanometer to 100 nanometers, you, are, you have nanomaterials. And above that, up to 10 fourths of nanometer, you have colloids. So we are somewhere there. We will have colloids and we have nanoparticles in the dispersions because one of these disadvantage of like liquid phase exfoliation is actually that you have a wide range of size of particles when you are exfoliating it. There are methods to, to segregate and separate the particles, but I didn't use them in my thesis. So if you have an idea, sand, the particle of sand would have five times the size of a nanoparticle. <laughs> and when we talk about the nanoplatelets of molybdenum, the sulfite, then we talk about lateral size, that's the size, uh, the biggest size of the part, let's say, around square nanometers in size, a range, and thickness around about one nanometer. It's a bit bigger than that, but round about. Okay. We've done the dispersions, and what can we do with it? Uh, one of the biggest uses for this dispersion, especially graphene, is to improve the, me the mechanical strengths of plastics. So if you add just 0.5% uh, waste percent graphene to, to, um, to a polymer, you can improve the strengths by, tw by two, two times which means that if you're using this polymer or this plastic in a car, you're reducing the weight of the car. If you're reducing the weight, you reduce fuel consumption, so it's just going in a loop, like you are improving the environment in this way. And then it comes one of the biggest potential markets for these materials, that's the polyesters. The production of polyesters that's mostly present in our clothes, it's around like 100 million tons a year. So it's a huge, huge market. And these, these dispersions can be added to, not to the white ones, right? <laughs> but they are transparent in the non scale. We have to remember that. These materials can be added to the textiles to also improve the strength of the fibers. And then you will make this, this fiber the strongest and you need less material. So it's all about reduction of material in this way you are, you are making sustainable production. Besides that, there is, uh, I, um, with the advent of the Internet of Things, more and more uh, sensors will be needed, and we need to produce these sensors in a sustainable way. So, printed in materials that can be recyclable and disposable in an in a environmental friendly way, it w it's a good strategy to follow alongside the development of the technology. So you don't want to end up with one more problem. That is the electronics waste. That's already a huge problem because it's extremely cheap to produce, ele produce electronics. So we, that, that's, that's what makes the, the things disposable, the price range, the price that they are in the, in the supply chain. So in this thesis, uh, we will talk a little bit, I talk a little bit about digital fabrication on sustainable substrates uh, using organic uh, inks. I will not touch this on the presentation today because I will focus on liquid phase exfoliation. Besides the, this printed electronics that not only organic inks can be used, but also the layered materials that are conducting like graphene can be used for the same purpose too. Uh, 
this, this exfoliated material can be used in supercapacitors. A group from Drive, they specialized on that. They, they do supercapacitors using graphene and uh, they, will, they will do batteries now. And, uh, and can also be used for transparent electrodes. Uh, that's the, one of the drives for studying these materials because there is a need to replace indium tin oxide that's getting more and more expensive and there, there wouldn't be resources available in, in a 20 time to, to comply with the demand. So, molybdenum disulfide. Where molybdenum disulfide is, is located on the, the periodic table? And which class of material does molybdenum disulfide belong to? Molybdenum disulfide is a transistor, transition metal dishal cogenite and uh, most of the transition metal tissue they are layered materials, which means they can exfoliate, individualize the solution process. And the good thing about them is that the electronic properties vary depending where they are located in the periodic table. And uh, the band gap will decrease as the calcogen mass increase. So, um, uh, the biggest uh, band gap material is the is the more than the sulfide. So that's why I use one of the most interesting to study. The difference between mon a monolayer of more than the sulfide and graphene is that in graphene you have a monolayer of carbon atoms. It's just one line of atoms, and in more than the sulfide you actually have three layers. So you have the calcogen atom uh, metal in the middle and you have the two layers of the, the um, uh, oh sorry, you have the metal, the molybdenum in the middle and the calcogen up sandwiching the, the molybdenum, which makes the three, three atomic layers. So why then use molybdenum the sulfide? When they, they first uh, learn about graphene and the, all the great, great applications that you can have with that, because initially it was thought that, although they knew that, gra that it was called graphene and there if, uh, that you had these uh, multiple layers in a, in a bulk uh, graphite crystal, you, you, it was not known that you could actually separate this layer. So once that you learned that you could separate this layer, and this was done 10 years ago by researchers in Manchester who got a Nobel Prize for it and that makes this, this this area to boom in terms of the number of publications so since then. Then there was a need to find other materials that could also be used as graphene in the nanoscale uh, world, but that have the properties that graphene lack. And what are the properties that graphene lack? One of the most important properties that graphene lack is a band gap. And if you don't have a band gap, you cannot make it uh, in transistors because you cannot switch on and off this, this uh, a device built out of it. So that's where you have molybdenum sulfide come in place. Molybdenum sulfide will have a tunable band gap. What does this mean? Like the band gap will change depending on the number of layers you have of the material and we go from an indirect band gap semiconductor to a direct sem band gap semiconductor, which means that if it's a direct band gap, it's like when you have to go to somewhere with a plane, you don't need to make a connection. So what happens, you go faster. So you can switch on and off this device faster. That's the great thing about it. But it only happens at monolayers. And already in a B layer, the band gap is not indirect anymore to, uh, direct anymore to be indirect. Besides, molybdenum sulfide is an abundant material and it's a very low cost. And, and that's why it's also very, very interesting to work with these materials. That they, they need to be low cost to be able to reach the market because the cost for production is a bit high uh, because of the low concentration you get. I will talk about that. Uh, it's a non-toxic material, which means that uh, it will not be toxic for the, for the aquatic systems if it's deposed in water and not even for us. We can eat molybdenum, but you don't need to wish to do it, of course. Uh, 
it's a, it's a material that has a high mobility. And, and this, this is like 200 square centimeters per volt sect. And that's what drove uh, Okanalin to choose this for the project. And uh, initially, his view was that if we have a flake, like uh, and Magzum Elgar built a device to measure mobility in the lab, and then we measured the mobility that was 50 square centimeter per volt second in one tiny flake. And that was just so great to imagine. If you can have one flake with 50 uh, square centimeter per volt per second in mobility, and if you put many of these flakes in a square kilometer, kilometer area, and you can make solar cells on paper. So that was the idea. Uh, these materials are inert, which means that they beat silicon there because silicon oxidizes. So molybdenum is a semiconductor would be the preferable. If it would, it would work as bad, as good as uh, silicon. And they are solution processable. That's why we are talking about liquid phase exfoliation. Okay. So then how can we do the liquid phase exfoliation? What are the methods that are available to do that? And we can use a sonication. A sonication is very similar than that sonication that you use to, to, to make images of the babies. It's the difference is that this is 10 times more powerful. And uh, that's why you can use it to break the van der Waal forces that separate these layers the, the stacks of the layers and have them individualized in solution. So when you have them in solution, you can have intercalants uh, like lithium, boron nitride, boron lithium, a lithium source, or you can have stabilizers as we will discuss here, like the, the, um, the cellulose stabilizer or surfactants or you have some great solvents that has matching surface energy like the NMP and methylpyrrolidone and DMF that can do the job without anything, but to a price of being highly toxic for the environment and for a pregnant woman, for an unborn child. So we need to avoid those solvents at all costs. That's why this, in, this thesis is interesting because we're focused on this replacement. Beside the ultrasonic um, uh, energy, what you can do is share exfoliation. Share exfoliation has the advantage of uh, um, scalability. So the work of Nicholas has focused quite a lot on share exfoliation, and he has also made a new, a new, new method to exfoliate layer materials. That's what makes his thesis very interesting as well. So we have... Um, Another method that is the best method to exfoliate layered materials, but of course, you have some drawbacks associated with that. Besides being the, uh, the method that you have the highest population of monolayers, this method has to be carried out in the, under argon conditions in a controlled environment, which makes the scalability also difficult. Okay. okay. So if you think about, in a molecular uh, dynamics perspective, what is happening is that when you have the bulk molybdenum disulfide before exfoliation, you will have these stacked layers of the, the material here. And then when you add this sonication energy or share exfoliation, you will break this, this, this van der Waal forces that hold these materials together, and they will be individualized in water. And then you have the, the, the other task that you need to keep them as they are individualized. So then that's where you, you wanted to, to have your material. And that's when it comes the publications of this uh, thesis. The logic that I follow for my PhD is that I started by looking what was not available there in the publication. So, when I look at the portfolio of um, uh, Jonathan Coleman, that is the biggest PI on this field, I saw that they haven't had done anything in water, even though it says it was not that good solvent, but why don't you show like why it doesn't work also? So my intention initially was to show why it doesn't work, <laughs> but then it ended up working for me. And 
they, they have done patents already in how to exfoliate uh, uh, the, the Moribidenium water. And this, in these patents, they, they argue that, yes, it's not exfoliating very well, but once you exfoliate and you decant it, you can redisperse these materials in a new solvent. So that was the drive of their patent. But we will discuss some paper. One, that actually if you pre-process the material, you, you exfoliate mechanically. Before you exfoliate in water, you can achieve a little bit higher yield, and that can be beneficial to do it without any surfactant or additive. Then um, we went to avoid this, this um, extra step of, uh, um, of processing also, and that's what we did in paper three using the, the cellulose stabilizer. But in paper two, we still did this pre-processing and add the surfactant to stabilize the nanosheet. All the approaches were successful. All of them, we achieved stable dispersions that could be uh, displaced with an inkjet printing head, and we could have this material deposited on any substrate. So the, the first paper that is presented in the thesis is not my my... My work as a first author, I contribute a little bit to this work. Uh, me and Magnus Hummelgaard, we start a, a, pre, pre, uh, um, a set of experiments before this publication that we want to test this fine um, layered materials and see uh, their response to the light. Because if this is a semiconductor with a very high refractive index, and it's so great optical properties that can be used in solar cells. We want to test this uh, at a very tiny scale if this would be our drive for the solar cells project. So I discuss what the, the findings of Ravin on the photo detector that he made uh, by exfoliating the, the layered materials, the molybdenum in nitric acid, that's why I don't focus on the exfoliation part of this work, because he used a different solvent. But it, what I want to show with this paper in this thesis is that, yes, it is possible to build the devices out of the exfoliated layer materials. And nowadays, they have been made even device fully, printed fully only with layered materials, as using graphene as gate and and uh, source electrode, and then you have the, the molybdenum disulfite as the semiconductor, and uh, boronitrite, which is also a layered material, as the insulator. This was done by the group of Jonathan Collins by, by Kelly, and it's a nature communication publication. So, the paper one, a, a, in, a, in a brief, in a nutshell, once again, what we did there is that we took the bulk molybdenum and we used a very scientific tool to, to exfoliate it. <laughs> this is a orbital sander because it's a, it will exfoliate by the friction. We send papers, then we collect this exfoliated material and, and reprocess it in liquid. Okay, so we expected that it will be uh, still a stack of materials there and then we individualize by adding even more energy to it and in water. And what we do then on paper two? Paper two, we also did this exfoliation with sand papers. We follow the same line of uh, thinking. And, but then we add these materials instead of to the uh, water solid, we, we add this to a surfactant solution. There, were, there has been work in the literature uh, pre, um, that, uh, that measure how this adhesion or adsorption of the surfactant gas happens on, on platelets like uh, the molybdenum sulfide. And they form like a semi cell, which means that the, the, the hydrophobic part of the, of the surfactant where you are there to the to the hydrophobic surface of the molybdenum, and you have the, the hydrophilic parts of the surfactants or the heads on the, on the, on the uh, solution. 
But then it would be very hard to draw like this, so I just did a simplification. <laughs> I did it like uh, just one molecule, but it's just for illustration, so you understand. Okay. Then recently, last week, this work is not on the thesis, so this is new for all of you, especially to you, uh, to the committee. So we, this is the paper, it's, uh, sorry, I have, should have mentioned this in the beginning, but this paper three is written on the thesis that was submitted, but I hold the submission of this paper because of this experiment. I had to add this to the, to the paper. It was possible to do it, and it proves the adhesion of molybdenum into the particles, and it's a good, a good, adhesion, a good addition to the paper, so it will come after the thesis, the submission. All right, so what we do in this experiment is that we add a, a positive uh, charge um, polymer to a silicon wafer surface. Then we start to feed the instrument with molybden platelets that are hydrophobic, hydrophobic, so they will interact with the hydrophilic parts of the polymer and, add, 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 and attach to it. And then you start to add a hack, the hydrophilic polymer. And we want to study how we, what will happen then when we start to add the molybdenum again on top of hack. So, so what happens is that we had a continuous adsorption of molybdenum, and this explains why these dispersions were so good, stable. So this, uh, these dispersions are illustrated here. Here I have like um, uh, the, the dispersion exfoliated in molybdenum sulfide and water without any stabilizer. So when I'm varying the, the centrifugation speed, I'm simulating a, a, a concentration decay rate, let's say, because the higher the speed, the less particles I will be in there will be water, so the concentration will reduce. And then you see that this, it becomes white quite fast here, but here you still have particles dispersed. So that proves how well this, this uh, system is working and how good heck can stabilize molybdenum in water. And this is a great finding for this paper. Okay, so we did the exfoliation in water we have our, our dispersion that doesn't look so crystal clear, so we know that we did some individualization of the particles. Then we need to study how well this exfoliation happened. And how do we do that? We use techniques to measure the size of the particles and the thickness. Here in our, in our university, we, we used to have a AFM, which, and with AFM, you can measure the size of these platelets when they are deposited in a silicon wafer. And uh, they were in the range of uh, 400 to 300 nanometers. And it's the same in surfactant. They were all in the same range as the, it's present on the literature. And uh, you can also measure the size of this and thickness of this part using TAM, the transmission electron microscopy. And we also have uh, measured some quite uh, big, big for, uh, in the word of nanoscale exfoliation, nanoplatys, which means that the exfoliation was successful. This is what this light tells us. But nowadays, uh, we have some more straightforward techniques and faster techniques that can be used to measure the thickness of the layers. And uh, luckily, we have the Mi lab here at Mitsui University. It's a fantastic endeavor. So, and with the Raman, you can f look for the, the bands, A2, G1, and A1G, and these are characteristics, ba characteristics bands of molybdenum sulfide. And once you follow the, the position of these bands, you can tell how many layers of the material you have. So basically, you will look for if, the, if this band, band here is moving towards a red shift or, and this one is moving towards a blue shift so that if they are separating, you are having a smaller, thinner particles. So we measure uh, 
the, the, these bands at 379 per, per centimeter and 404 centimeters frequency. And, and according to the literature, we would have like four layers, which is okay for liquid phase exfoliation. This is a particle that uh, we look from the Raman microscope, so it's an optical uh, image. And I make the Raman on these uh, 39 points. <laughs> and they were all in the same position. So which means that I didn't have a change in, in thickness on this flake here, or if it's multiple flakes. But then there was uh, this black color here and uh, the, this experiment that I talk later on about the adhesion it helps me to explain that actually this is probably heck. It's probably the polymer that's attached to the surface there. So this is the results from the literature that I base my studies in to evaluate the number of layers. So you can see that uh, this, for one layer, the position of the, the bent would be here, and four layers is more or less where we got our results. So then they, they did this, their experiments in the silicon wafer as well, and, there, and, and you can see how, how they, the, the shifts uh, that they had. And how this, this paper is a reference for this kind of study. Okay. Then we talk about the thickness, right, of the layered materials. And now we wish to talk about the size. If we have to use the AFM and the TAM to measure the size of the park, it will take forever. So there is also a need to look for experiments that, that we can, uh, techniques that we can use to circumvent the use of, uh, of, um, of techniques that take too much time to, to evaluate. So we use DLS, so dynamic like scattering, to evaluate the size of the particles. And these results, they are, they are, um, uh, they relate to the results in using the other technologies. So if you use the measure the bulk more then you will be like around two micromix. And uh, once you exfoliate the size of the particles, we will go around 200 nanometers, and this is lateral size. As you can see, the, the size is, is a, is a, histo is a um, I, you have a different, si different uh, distribution yeah. of uh, size, so, so it's an average of size. And when we use surfactant, what, what means that even though if they, it didn't really depend on the concentration, the size range was the same, which means that you could reduce the concentration quite a much on surfac. This also means like a positive point for scalability and, and um, commercialization. We always have to think about how to reduce the amount of material use. That's uh, chemical engineering thinking. Reduce the time of production, reduce the materials you use. Okay, so there are another technique that uh, we are using here at uh, Mitsu University in our group to measure the size of the particles that we deposit uh, a drop of the um, of these layered materials dispersions on a on a polished uh, aluminium uh, stud, and then we measure the the size and could also do that deposit on silicon wafer, and we. Again, uh, what I did in the paper three is that I start with two different materials, uh, two different grades of morbidin. One grade was, had a range around 0 0.47 millimeter size from start with. My goal with that was like, if I start with a very big particle, can I end up with a big, bigger particle after exfoliation? The answer was no. It was more or less in the same range of particles when you exfoliate. This was one question that uh, uh, Arlene O'Neill uh, from the group of Jonathan Colomb put on, the, on her paper, but she didn't answer, and I tried to answer that question with my experiment. Okay, so then this, this other material is the same material I used in the other papers. This, the, this bulk uh, molybdenum that has much smaller particle size we start with. And after exfoliation, the particles were around 0 0.4 micrometer in size. Okay. 
Then, uh, just to, as a matter of comparison, again, I was trying to look for methods that, uh, that we could use to measure this size distribution. And since we, our TAM was not working, uh, I used mainly the SAM, but I also need to know if it was uh, uh, compatible with the results with TAM. So I did the experiment using the two techniques with the same dispersion. And actually, I found that when I measure with TAM, you are selecting the particles that you measure. And of course, you can make a statics, a statistics uh, out of it and so on. But in 200 particles that we measure, we, we end up like with 200 nanometer um, size range of this uh, platelet. But when you're using the SAM, uh, we are not selecting uh, the particles. We're measuring the whole surface. So we had much, a much larger number of particles. And then that affect the result. And it, we end up having half size of the particles. So it, it's not really right to say that SAM or TAM was better to measure it. But it was different the way we measure it. So you measure more particles in one technique. So we talk about the size of the particles. We talk about the thickness of the particle. And the last question that is open there to answer about, the, the, about this liquid phase exfoliation dispersion that we always have to take care of, it's the stability. How, how big, how long is the shelf life of these materials? Because it doesn't make sense, again, if you exfoliate and then you, you you have them in the table and they will sediment. So it, it basically that what you did is, is worthless. So the, the shelf life of these particles has to be strong enough that you can commercialize. Uh, so how do we measure the stability? Here, in my work, I measure stability in two ways. First, I measure the stability through electrophoretic mobility using the same instrument that I can use to measure the particles at the same time. So it's great. It's two, two shots at once. You measure the zeta potential or the, the electrophoretic mobility that you can measure with this device. Because measure zeta potential is really not possible. You always have an estimation of it. So um, the theory says that if you have zeta potential higher than in modulus also, very, negatively higher than minus 25 or positively higher than 25, then you have a stable dispersion. The results that we have in water was a zeta potential of minus 32 millivolts. It's not that high, but it's higher than 25. So when Coleman says it's not stable in water, the thermodynamics uh, theory say that this will not work. Yes, but the zeta potential says that it works. So some particles will be dispersed in water, even though some other particles will not be. So you have particles that will be in the range of instability of the zeta potential. So there will be sedimentation. So you didn't solve all the problems. <laughs> okay. So another way that I measured the stability in this work was through co concentration. You measure the concentration over time. And I must say that uh, in the last minute, I had a comment from Jonathan Collins on my paper that actually would change a lot of my results. So I didn't change the results for today. But because it's not wrong, it just could be better, let's say. It would save a lot of time for the future. Why? Because in the initial papers from Jonathan Collins that I follow, they always subtract the background to measure the concentration. But it's not necessary to do it anymore, because they found that the, it doesn't affect so much the concentration. But still, it's, it's, it's not wrong. It's just a different approach. How do we measure the concentration? Uh, the concentration of these dispersions are so small that we can use a, 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 a table uh, um, how do use? The, to measure the absorption through the Berlin-Bell law to absorb uh, using the berlin bell law. So if we have the extinction coefficient of this material, then we measure the absorption. We know the length of the, of the, the path that uh, the light will go through when measuring this, this absorption. Then we can estimate the concentration. 
And we estimate this concentration in a particular position. And this is that uh, the 777 nanometer, that is like 1.83 electrovolts. And why do we measure the absorption at this particular position? Because yes, because it's, that's the position of the band gap for molybdenum sulfide. So this measurement doesn't, doesn't only help us to estimate the concentration, but it also tells that this is molybdenum sulfide in this version. Okay, so what I did, I, I'm, I'm interested on in the shelf life of the material, right? So then I measure this over time, daily, at the same time, the same dispersion that was very well sealed, so then uh, to avoid the evaporation. So I can evaluate how the concentration is changing. So if I take the, the red curve here, this would be a day one, and then of course the concentration is dropping. So it means the particles are sediment. If you translate this into, um, oh, sorry. Okay, then if you can do the same ex experiment doing centrifugation, and then you are also simulating uh, the days that this shelf life, how, how long time this, this dispersions would stand in a shelf without sediment, or sediment not so much that wouldn't, would not be able to use them anymore. So I use the, the um, centrifugation which is good because much faster. I don't need to use for, to wait for 15 days. Okay, then when I translate this result into concentration, uh, I have this, these values here. So the concentration of my dispersion is at 1,500. That's the lowest um, centrifugation rate that I had was around 23 milligram per liter. And at the, the lowest centrifugation speed, that means you are not sedimenting all the unexfoliated particles. Of course, you will have a much higher concentration. And this, will, of course, will, uh, will change uh, the longer this dispersions are st uh, standing on the bench, let's say. When you use HEC, uh, we could achieve uh, different concentrations depending on the amount of HEC that you have. With surfactants, we didn't observe this. We observed that surfactants was monotonic and increased the concentration. But with HEC, we achieve like up to 40 milligrams per liter at one gram per liter concentration HEC. So how do we compare our work with the works of others? It's a bit tricky. So um, Joaquin Backstrom, he gave this idea to, to actually um, measure the concentration decay rate through an equation, a first order reaction equation. So then we can estimate like when, in number of hours, our, the disp our dispersion, the dispersions of our, our colleagues uh, the, in the literature would uh, have the same concentration. So, I mean, when we take Coleman's work and they use NMP and sonication and is the best solvent to disperse, there is no doubt about it. So these dispersions will be stable forever, like 6,000 hours. It's a long, long, long stability. But, um, and then if we, if we take the, here, if you take the initial concentration, not the, the concentration after centrifugation, for example, which is much lower, then this number drops a little bit because you start with a very high concentration but also end up with a very low concentration dispersion. So in our work in water, um, we had like 23 hours uh, that these dispersions will have half the concentration than when we start the experiment. When you use sodium collate, that's another surfactant, it's a very famous work also from Coleman's group. We, they achieve 167 hours or 720, depending on the initial concentration that I took to measure the, the, the calculation, to, put, to use the calculation. In our work in paper three, we achieve very similar results as in sodium collate surfactant. So it means that with a more environment-friendly stabilizer, you can achieve very similar results. So this was a good, good result that we got. Yeah. And uh, 
my results in Sergeant Sergeant Dudesin sulfate was actually worse than him, his result. Uh, sodium dodecyl sulfate is not one of the best surfactants for the, the liquid phase exfoliation. There are a number of other surfactants that surpass, but, uh, but my intention at that time was just to reduce the surface energy to be able to print. Not really work so much on the stability using surfactant or the increase of uh, concentration. Okay, um, so we did the dispersions, we evaluated that they have a very good size, they are thin, they are numbered and have good lateral size. So now we want to produce something, we want to print, we want to, to make a device out of it. So how can you do it? So to sum up, you have your materials, the bulk powder and the stabilizer, you do the liquid phase exfoliation, you get a dispersion, it's very black, there's a lot of material that's not individualized here. You need to decantate, centrifugate, you end up with a little bit clear dispersion that you can use in a printing head, and then you can be the device. All right. Then uh, the device that I made was not done by, by inkjet printing, but I did in a very simple method, with a very, very simple method. I got a crystal of uh, like this size, more or less this big, that I could just exfoliate the layers of the molybden mechanically. And I had a very big flake of molybden that I could use to evaluate the photo, the photo properties, the optical properties of it. So this flake is the same material that I use in my, <laughs> in my uh, dispersions. Um, so what I did is that I deposit this uh, in a polymid uh, plastic and I, I put some gold on top as to, to act as a, the, the, to flow the electricity through the, the material and then you shine light on it. So initially, these were the experiments that me and Magna Pumagor did. So we put the flake uh, in, a, in a glass slide and then we, we have some gold wires to measure the photon conductivity using this, this simulator of solar cells, this solar energy source. So we turn on and off the light and measure the, the current. So this is the current in the dark, and then you, you turn on the, the light and this current will increase. And this different in, in the current, in, in, the, in the dark and in the light, it's called photocurrent. So we did the same using these flakes, but then instead of the gold wires like this, that was hard for us to measure the, it, there was a lot of resistance here. So we got better results. Then we could measure the photocurrent and the bias of 30 millivolts with the light intensity of this, this, this at 20 millivolts. And in this way, we could measure the photoresponsivity of our device. That was 0 0.23 milli million pairs per watt. Is it great, this result? Yes, it's quite good. If you compare in the literature, we were not far from the results that were they achieved. So with this, I come to the end of my presentation. And uh, I would like to give some conclusions of what we achieved. So we discussed methods that to exfoliate and stabilize the nanosheets of 2D materials with and without stabilizers. And uh, we achieve a concentration in water at 0 0.14 grams per liter, which is half of the concentration in, in organic, like, organic uh, solvents. So, so it was a quite good uh, result. And uh, in the presence of HEC, that was our uh, leading paper, let's say this way, the, this, this concentration was around uh, 40 milligrams per liter. So it was, it was a quite good. So I would like to thank you for your attention and also thank my supervisor, Professor Magnus Norgen and Professor Hukanolin and Professor Lars Berlund that was helping me during this time in Stockholm. My family, Ralph and Hannah, Mitsui University for providing the infrastructure and materials for me to perform my research. 
and funding, and also the KTH and through the Wallenberg Wood Science Center uh, that provide funding for five months of this research and the Alice and Knut Wallenberg Foundation, the KK Foundation that was funding most of this work, and Ulforsk and J. Gustavishan Foundation that will fund my postdoc. So thank you very much for everyone. Thank you.